Hi, Kevin. Hey, Tony. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Give me a second to uh... fix my hair. Can you just test to make sure my headphones are working? Uh, what do you want me to do? Just talk? Yeah, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Should I be wearing headphones? Would that be more useful? Uh, you know what? I can't even get mine to work right now, so okay, I'm I'm hardly the person to be giving you advice. All right, this is my last. Uh... Can you talk one more time for me? Sure. I, um, <laughs> I don't know what I should tell you, but. Uh, uh... I'm going to ditch those. OK, so it's not working? Not working for me. All right. Can I ask, uh, I hope your daughter's doing well. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's fine. She's um, hopped up on painkillers and anti-inflammatories to hold her over until some surgery can be done. So um, our healthcare system is not on it, in its best shape at the moment. So, mm. so there's a lot of a lot of delays. So, oh, she, she's doing OK. I'm sorry to hear that. How are you doing? Fine. You? Yeah, I'm good. Well, thanks for joining me. Where are you coming from again? I'm coming from Philadelphia. Okay. Yeah. South Philly specifically. And how long have you been doing this? Um, probably since just since the winter. Yeah. Not very long at all. <clears throat> As by virtue of the, uh, the headphones not working and the audio. <laughs> and, and why are you doing it? That's a great question. Um, at first, it kind of started because there's a few Genesis stories. Uh, I'll give you the shortest one. Sure. Uh, I got invited to a party. Um, and as many good stories start. And uh, the party was going to be themed such that we had, we were all assigned a name. One that we didn't really know that well. And we all had to, and it was like kind of a bunch of couples. And we had to uh, come up with an interview question, sort of like a tough question <laughs> by like calling their friends and family and everything. And maybe it was going to be like 12 or 15 of us. Well, the party ended up not happening. If it, if it had happened, I think like 12 out of 15 people would have had COVID at the same time. Right. So we, we called it off, but I had this question and everybody I called, I couldn't give me that much information about, well, I, it wasn't very fruitful calling other people and like having them give me clues about what would be a good question to ask them but i still had fun doing it and i remember thinking like oh damn i wish that <laughs> i wish that had happened uh and i think at the same time i was reading um randomly one of elaine pagels books uh i think it was called it was it was not the gnostic gospels but it was about the like adam and eve and the serpent or something is that that one um, no, I think it was one of her earlier ones. I think it was a uh, beyond belief. Name okay. came to me. And I don't know. One day I put the book down. I was kind of frustrated that I didn't get that party to happen. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the back and I thought, yeah, I kind of looked her up and she had these email or these interviews rather like in the early two thousands. And I thought, I wonder if I just emailed her. She's in Princeton. It's like a 45 minute ride from here. Um, and sure enough, she was like gracious enough to be like, come on up, uh, and I realized that if I liked asking questions and that people were willing to talk to me who would otherwise not be willing to talk to me, I, I assume, or like they wouldn't want to get lunch with me. Right. So I was like, oh, wow, look at this. I have a podcast. So I started interviewing some of my friends just to kind of like get the rust off before I talked to, to Elaine. I went up there. I was like totally unpracticed. I put a recorder on the ground. You know, she was probably laughing at me the whole time, but it was a great conversation. So I realized that there's like people I would want to talk to that wouldn't get lunch with me or like I, I couldn't possibly put it under the banner of networking. Uh, so I was like, you know what, let me just start saying I have a podcast and see who wants to talk to me and I'll just ask questions <laughs> I'd be interested in knowing the answer to. Um, and it's amazing. Like there's this uh, incredible university, like right across the bridge from me, UPenn and, uh, 
you know, these, these professors just like, you know, are totally experts. They just walk around the city. And most of the time, nobody's asking them a question mm -hmm. uh, and you get them going and it's, it's incredible. So that's the origin story. We all just want to see ourselves on fi on film, so to speak. Um, so it's it's you're, you're getting people at their egos. You uh, think so? I think a little bit. Uh, certainly, there is, there is uh, uh, some of us are uh, have an interest in, in public facing scholarship about about you know not just talking to scholars, talking about talking to people, and even writing books for regular people. Um, mm. So I think that's part of it too, for sure. Um, it's nice to, to, to get our ideas out to a wider audience. Yeah. Oh, I'm curious. Cause I went up to, um, when I went up to Princeton, I was really nervous cause I didn't go to a, I didn't go to an Ivy league school. I'm even trying to remember if Princeton is Ivy, but it's a good school at the least. And I was like, you know, she probably gets great questions all the time. Like who, you know, it's just nice that she's willing to take the time. Um, and I remember <laughs> I couldn't find her office at first. And then, you know, we had to change plans. I ended up like meeting her somewhere else. And I was outside her office and there was a paper sort of like pinned to the door. And I started reading the paper and I was like, oh, this isn't that good. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was like, this will this will be fine. And I, I guess I'm curious, like, you know, not to badmouth your students by any stretch of the imagination. Like, what is what is that like? This might be a huge question to open up what is it like sort of getting really specific in your own research, but then like teaching these classes where maybe kids are thinking about this for the first or second or third time. Is it frustrating getting like waves and waves of similar questions or um, is it a, uh, might you sometimes be like wishing that somebody who wasn't interested in these things came, came asking questions about them. Cause I, I seem to think that people like, someone who's not a New Testament scholar asking these questions. And, you know, occasionally I'll be like, well, who is, who is Bishop Irenaeus, right? And sometimes they seem to like, like those questions where I, I would have feared maybe that that would be a stupid question. No, I think it's a, it's a good reminder that not everyone has the same um, base of knowledge as you do. And, and when you're, you're teaching, you always have to keep that in mind that the students in the room come from varying uh, have varying levels of knowledge of uh, your field. Like my courses, for example, don't have any prerequisites, so I can't assume anyone knows anything. So it's always good to have the kind of, kind of a reminder about about what I need to make sure students know, or or what things I can throw in the course outline, so I don't have to keep talking about them in in the class. So the information is there for them, um, and uh, I don't think there's ever a, a there's not there are no stupid questions really uh, um but um there's a, a a podcaster i like uh shirley paulson and she uh, uh she's uh not an academic not a trained academic uh, at least not a you know not a not a working academic in the sense that she's a professor but she knows her stuff but every time she does a podcast she asks these really naive questions like, tell me, what is this remarkable text? And she knows it, mm -hmm. but she doesn't expect her audience to know it necessarily. So every podcast has to be a, a fresh um, topic uh, as if the, that person is going to be watching it for the very first time. Yeah. Um, and he used, there used to be a, uh, um, a, a philosophy of sorts when it comes to to, to comic books, um, which I'm, I'm I'm a fan of, um, that every every issue is supposed to be for a new reader. So you always have to be careful about, you know, sometimes it can get really bad with exposition where suddenly you have to explain everything all the time. But the I, the point is you you don't want it to be um, uh, impenetrable for new readers with all of this lore and canon and so on. So you have to be very careful of that kind of thing. Um, so I went off on a tangent there about comics, but uh, same basic kind of idea. We always have to keep in mind that, that not everyone uh, has that base of knowledge that, that necessarily people who have done their PhD have. Hmm. So before, I guess before we push off too far, do you mind just introducing yourself, maybe saying who you are, what you do um, in, in the spirit of exposition? <laughs> sure. Um, so, um, I teach at York University in Toronto. It's it's uh, 
the, the poor cousin of sorts to the University of Toronto, which is downtown, and we are north of the city, it tends to be a place where commuters come um, from, from the wider, what we call the greater Toronto area. Uh, I've been there for about 20 years now, and um, I, I'm a trained New Testament scholar, so I teach, so I teach Bible courses, um, but my research interests are in Christian Apocrypha. Um, so the stories that are not, stories about Jesus and his friends and his family that are not actually in the New Testament, and uh, that's what I worked on for my for my PhD as well. I worked on a text called the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which is one of our, our earliest apocryphal texts, uh, with stories about Jesus as a child. So it's not a period of Jesus' life which are, is not covered in the New Testament Gospels, and so um, so yeah, I call a New Testament scholar with an interest in Apocrypha, but the training is all the same. And so I, the same skills I apply to the New Testament, I can apply to Apocryphal texts and vice versa. Um, and yeah, I've carved out a little niche for myself in the field, uh, working with this material. Um, some time ago, uh, I was part of the creation of uh, um, an association of scholars called the North American Society for the Study of Christian Apocryphal Literature, or NASCAL for short. Yeah. And um, we do certain uh, cer certain projects um, with a with an outward facing kind of public kind of uh, wider public, um, the hope of, of of touching a wider public in what we do. So we have a website with a, with a great big database related to apocryphal texts. We do a series. Um, um, of translations um, of texts and I'm also editor of a series called More New Testament Apocrypha which uh, the idea of that is to publish texts that are not as widely known um, most collections of Apocrypha cover texts from the first three centuries or so mm -hmm. so we're looking at trying to publish texts or republish texts um, from later than that time period uh, because the Apocrypha doesn't, uh, they don't stop creating Apocrypha once the Bible gets assembled in the 4th century. People keep writing this material, and so we're trying to put a bit of a focus on this, uh, these other texts, some of which are very, very important, but uh, don't get um, the due attention uh, that, they, that they certainly deserve. So those are basically the projects I, I'm, uh, I'm working on these days. Cool. And... If you don't mind just defining what apocrypha means maybe in the field I, I i don't know if i'm naive and just assuming it means non-canonical um i i certainly just treat them as as synonymous is there a more technical or i guess i'd even be interested in the etymology of that word apocrypha. sure um the word means uh, uh revelation or secret not revelation that's apocalyptic sorry about that um it means secret essentially or esoteric um it's not in and of itself a, a bad word, but it takes on a pejorative tone uh, by some early Christian writers who are, use that term for texts that, are, that they don't consider acceptable. So it becomes almost synonymous with, with, with forgery or lie, but it, doesn't, it didn't originally have that, term, that, that sense. It just meant secret or hidden. Um, and so these are texts that um, people who are outside what we would call Orthodox Christianity, which is the type of Christianity that we basically have today with its particular views on Jesus and God. Um, people outside Orthodox Christianity are, are writing and disseminating, though, though, though that, isn't, that definition doesn't quite work as well as it used to, and I, I can explain that in a minute. But uh, basically what you have is in the early, in, uh, as soon as Jesus uh, shuffles off this mortal coil, people start writing things about him. Some of those writings end up in the New Testament, the 27 books we're most familiar with. Some of them do not. And so anything that's not in the New Testament generally gets labeled apocrypha by uh, people in the Orthodox tradition, those people who like the New Testament as it was crafted, uh, what they, the texts that they don't like. Um, but just to the people who valued those texts and wrote those texts, they, of course, did not consider them apocrypha. They just called them scripture or just valued them in some way. But they are texts that are like what's in the New Testament. So we have um, New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we have Apocryphal Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, etc. Um, we have the canonical Book of Acts, which is sent, a lot of it focuses on the Apostle Paul, 
but it is generally all of the apostles after Jesus' death and their exploits. But we have apocryphal acts as well, usually focusing on individual apostles. So an acts of Thomas, an acts of Paul, an acts of Peter, etc. The um, New Testament has epistles, so epistles of Paul, letters of Paul. But we have apocryphal epistles too. Some Ooh. said to be written by Paul, one even said to be written by Jesus. And the last category of text in the New Testament is uh, apocalypses. So the, the book of Revelation is an apocalypse, um, stories about the end time. But we have non-canonical apocalypses too, apocalypse of Peter, apocalypse of Thomas, etc. So all the same types of literature, but just not, they just weren't selected for inclusion in the New Testament, even though some of them were very popular even after the closing of the New Testament, kind of in a, almost like an extracurricular reading kind of a category. But some were, uh, uh, some were less popular and um, almost got lost to uh, history until we found them in archaeological sites or some the back rooms of some libraries and such. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I guess I have a few questions stemming from that. You said most Apocrypha written in, I believe, the first three centuries, right? Well, I wouldn't say most, uh, the mo most well-known. Okay. Uh, certainly it was a, a time of prolific writing, lots of writing about Jesus, but it didn't stop then. Right. Um, but it used to be that people would, would kind of talk about it as if they did. So we, we think about the New Testament gets formed uh, somewhere in the middle of the fourth century, and then all the other stuff just gets lost. It's gone um, until the Renaissance, when scholars start publishing this material, they do what we call critical editions, where they grab all the manuscripts they can of something, try to figure out what the original readings were, and we publish them and get them in, in translations. So this is kind of a dark period between the fourth and say the, 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 the 16th centuries, but that's not really how it works at all. People kept writing them for different reasons. It's, uh, it seems that it seems you can get ideas across a lot better if you're working with characters, with fictional, um, um, environments rather than say doing a, a sermon or a, a treatise or something like that it's far more interesting to hear things right from the mouth of paul than from the mouth of say bishop augustine or someone like that though you know we still have those as well so people kept writing them but also people kept po copying them as well so we have lots and lots of copies of, of some of these texts some of them very few copies but some lots um i'll give you one example the uh a text called the protoevangelium of james sometimes called the infancy gospel of james and this tells the story it's called a protoevangelium because most of the events take place before the gospels in the new testament so it's a proto gospel and it tells the stories of uh, mary's conception and birth and then some story some stories with with her and joseph leading up to jesus birth and then a few stories thereafter it's not in the new testament it was probably written somewhere in the late second century not in the new testament but very, very, very popular. We have hundreds of manuscripts of it in Greek, which is the original language, but also lots of translations into other languages like Arabic and Latin and so on and so forth. So widely popular. And if you see any iconography related to um, the, the birth of Jesus in the Eastern church, um, so Greek church, you will see elements of the, of the Protoevangelium of James's version of that story in there. So it's very much part of Eastern Christian thought and imagery, even though it's not in the New Testament. So we have, and we have several other examples of those kinds of texts that were very, very popular, even though they weren't in the New Testament. So I, I mentioned kind of like having this kind of extracurricular kind of reading book, a, a kind of a, another compendium of material, which, which gets transmitted not as a group necessarily, but beside the New Testament over time. And sometimes people will dip into it occasionally when they want some new, some story that they like and throw it into a sermon or put it into artwork or, or uh, create new stories from it. So it's not, the, it's not that sense that all these texts are lost. And we often hear that phrase, lost gospels. Um, they, they've always been there. Um, they just weren't necessarily considered authoritative or, or uh, scriptural. And even though we get people who over time, like I said, call them apocrypha and say nasty things about them, it doesn't mean people weren't using them. And in fact, the fact that they keep telling people not to use them 
shows us that they were people were using them so so we can't always listen to the 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 writers of the church over the centuries and how much they dislike some of these texts because people other people did like them and did use them so we need this kind of a, a more holistic view of of the transmission of the literature to understand that um, just because some elements of the church don't like don't like them that they were completely uh, ignored by everybody else because that the evidence shows that that's not the case at all I know this answer is going to have, uh, or this question rather, is going to have many different answers. But who who was writing, who who was writing these things? Uh, do you have a sense of like the type of person, or do we even at moments know the actual author? Uh, rarely do we know the actual author. Um, I'm actually uh, doing some work on a text right now called the Acts of Paul. Um, so this is stories that focus just on Paul after the death of Jesus, and. We know from a writer named Tertullian, who's writing in the end, uh, sorry, beginning of the third century, it's the end of the second century, beginning of the third century, about the creation of this text, because he talks about it, he doesn't like it, and he says that, and he's, uh, he's talk, he says that there's some uh, person in the church in Asia Minor, uh, modern day Turkey, who wrote the text, and he's been punished for doing so. Mm. Though this author claimed to be doing it out of love for Paul. So that gives us a bunch of bits of information there. It gives us a, a time period when this text was written, somewhere around the late second century. Uh, that's that that the person who wrote it did it out of, of uh, piety, of uh, um, thinking that they were doing a good thing. Yet we have elements in the church, like Tertullian himself, who did not like it. And the reason he didn't like it is because of the way it portrays a certain female character in a, the text called Thecla. Um, she's considered to be the first female martyr and um, in the story um, she baptizes herself and this is scandalous to, 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 to Tertullian um, the idea that women could baptize so that also shows us that there are factions in the church that that supported female baptism and, and the, such roles within the church uh, baptism by females by women and factions that did not um, but that's a rare example where we have someone connected to an actual text. We don't get the name, but we get some information. Generally, they, these things are anonymous um, because they are, of course, creating a, a situation with these texts. They're, they're, uh, in some cases, they are claiming to be a certain author. This is claiming to be Paul writing a letter, claiming to be um, Timothy writing a letter, things like that. So they wouldn't want to have their own name on it because they're, they're creating a text as if from a from you know centuries past sometimes the texts are written about people so the acts of paul is about paul it's not written by paul right but they generally we don't get authors names on these things um so who is writing them um it really it, um They can be done for various reasons, but usually there's something going on in the Christian community, the particular Christian community from where this thing was based, that uh, has led to the creation of this text. Why might we do it? Well, maybe you've just created a new church in your community and you want some kind of a connection between that church and uh, an early Christian figure. So you craft a story in which this church is based on the evangelization of the area by a particular apostle. So let's say, um, say John. So now we have a text which, in which John uh, evangelized this community where this new church has been built. So now you can promote your church as something that John actually um, um, established. And that happens quite a lot. We get con connections between churches and particular apostles, particular figures. So great for the pilgrimage industry. Um, and sometimes it's to institute a new uh, festival. We have this, there's a bunch of these um, Coptic, uh, meaning Egyptian, um, texts that were written somewhere around the 5th century, 6th century, so after the formation of the canon. But these are created in order to help uh, create Christianity. So Christianity is now the, the religion of the empire. It's replacing the pagan gods, the pagan churches, sorry, the pagan temples, pagan festivals. So we need to institute new ones. And the New Testament doesn't tell us about such things because that was, you know, first century, second century uh, times. But we need some way to say that this particular festival has been 
sanctioned by God and his representatives or this particular church, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and so they create these texts in which um, uh, a, a figure from New Testament times, from early f the first century, essentially sets up this, this festival or sets up a certain practice, a certain doctrine. And they craft it as an apocryphal text. So we have the characters from the first century uh, creating these things um, that will eventually truly be put into operation in the fifth or sixth century or so. So um, these are people within what we consider the orthodox tradition. They're not Gnostics from the first and second century or whatever. They're not weird Christians. They're people who value the New Testament and value certain uh, church writers that come after them. But they see value in creating a text that will establish new practices in their own time. Uh, this might be a stretch, but that reason can't be all together that different from some of the authors of the canonical texts, right? I imagine we know that some, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and I don't know about John has an asterisk for me. I, I'm not, I'll defer to you on that one, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke weren't written by Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right? And that that reason that you give might be the same reason that those were written. Yeah, I, I like the fact that you're not really you're seeing that this there's not really a big distinction between canonical and non-canonical in some right, way. Right. Yeah, it's widely believed by scholars that the first uh, that the New Testament Gospels, even John, um, were originally anonymous, and the names didn't get attached to them until probably late in the second century or mid second century. So these were um, these don't have names on them either, um, and we don't know how accurate they are historically. Um, Mark, if Mark was the earliest gospel, was written somewhere around 40 years after Jesus' death. Plenty of time for legends to get a, a, you know associated with Jesus, uh, with things um, where sayings of Jesus get uh, created to establish new practices. Even even um, the mission to Gentiles, for example. Um, which by the time Mark is written in the in the 70s has become established that Christianity is getting more and more popular towards Gentiles and Jews. But all the stories about Jesus, uh, well, not all the stories, but the vast majority of stories of Jesus in the Gospels are, are of Jesus uh, uh, preaching to his fellow Jews. So at some point that change gets made and it gets reflected in the texts. So yeah. the texts were written uh, to justify or... or or establish that Jesus did this earlier on, even though he probably didn't. Um, so yeah, um, and then we have several texts in the New Testament that are pseudepigraphical, meaning that they're, they're written by someone else whose name is on them. So for example, uh, we have seven letters of Paul that we think Paul did really write, but then we have another six that we think Paul didn't write. Oh. So what's really the difference between those six texts, in a sense, that, that are pseudepigraphical and therefore false, and uh, uh, what we call apocryphal uh, letters of Paul, like the epistle to the Laodiceans or the third epistle to the Corinthians or the epistle to the Alexandrians, none of which are in the New Testament, but also written in Paul's name with contents that he never uh, actually wrote, right? So there's a, sometimes the distinction is a bit blurry. Um, the main distinction, though, that we can say between apocryphal texts and canonical texts is probably the date. Um, for uh, the New Testament material does seem to be written earlier than most apocryphal texts. There might be a few written early. The Gospel of Thomas is usually an example people come up with. Um, but for the, for the most part, apocryphal texts were written later than what we find in the New Testament. That doesn't mean they're necessarily more or less truthful uh, historically. Um, but um, I guess if, if anyone wants to try and establish what Jesus actually said and did, you're probably on good um, methodological ground to go with the ones that are uh, composed the earliest, even if they are slightly, even though even if those have have transformed the Jesus story for their own particular reasons, even within forty to sixty years. Interesting. Um, you said that just because these are written later doesn't make them any less important uh how are these things important like what makes them important um 
they were certainly pushed away as being not important by the established church as it becomes more established, right? So what makes it important maybe to scholars or maybe in hindsight or however I might frame that? Yeah, well, again, if say you, so the example I was doing about the historical Jesus, what's important to you is first century documents. But if you're interested in fifth century Egypt, the Coptic church in first fifth century Egypt, then text written at that time will be important to you. Or if you're interested in um, medieval uh, France, then texts that were written within that area, texts about Mary Magdalene uh, as being connected to that area, or James, the Apostle James, then those texts will be important to you. It's all a matter of what you want to study and what period of time you th you find most interesting. Yeah. That's why, you know, with this... Um, um, this more New Testament Apocrypha series, for example, um, we we are purposefully saying there are other texts from other times that are uh, just as important in a sense that they tell some aspect of Christian history and that they deserve some, some attention as well. So certainly some, uh, some people would prefer to focus on early apocryphal texts because it's closer to the time of the when the church was created, close to the first century. Um, sometimes some people will want to focus more on specifically New Testament texts for certain ideas. But uh, there are more and more of us within my field of Christian Apocrypha studies that are interested in texts from later centuries. Um, and again, in part, it's uh, some of these texts were, were more important to certain people than the texts in the New Testament. Um, the book of Revelation, for example, this, uh, a lot of Christian uh, centers did not care much for that text. Um, so it's really not important to them, though we think because it's part of that 27 book canon that it's equally as important as every text in there. But that's not necessarily the case. And so that you might find a few texts here and there that are non-canonical, like the Infancy Gospel of James, for example, that's far more important than a canonical text when it comes to uh, um, uh, worship of Jesus or um, the celebration of Christmas and all those uh, other um, important aspects of, of Christian piety. Hmm. I, kn I know, I guess all my questions are going to have multiple answers, but where are these things found? When are they found? Are there treasure troves where I know the Dead Sea Scrolls um, aren't Christian? Um, but are there moments like that where we find a collection of those books? Yeah, but when Renaissance scholars, as, as I was mentioning, were starting to create uh, critical editions, they mostly would, would um, go through uh, libraries that were local to them. Uh, so say um, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris or the British Library in London. And these libraries would have acquired manuscripts from various places, sometimes stealing them from people, sometimes buying them or whatever. And then some more enterprising scholars would visit some uh, monasteries in the East, um, say St. Catherine's Monastery in the, um, uh, in, um, the Sinai Peninsula, the desert there. Um, and then bring them back and then use them to create their critical editions. So, at first, most scholars would go into libraries, either the main libraries in Europe or going to libraries outside Europe. But these would be mostly manuscripts, maybe as early as, say, the 10th century, maybe a few earlier than that, but generally 10th to the 15th centuries. To get um, the really important manuscripts would be earlier than that, particularly when it comes to apocryphal texts, because apocryphal texts do, change, do tend to change quite a lot over time. Because they're not in the New Testament, they're not. They don't. Have, they're not as rigidly um, 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 transmitted as, say, a, a, a text from the New Testament. Though even New Testament texts can get changed over time. So the earlier, the better when it comes to manuscripts uh, of these texts. If you want to construct the original text, if you just want to see what version is uh, that seems to be popular in this area versus a version in this area, that's that's all. That's also valid as well. But it's really nice to be able to get the earliest form, right? So these tend to come from archaeological excavations. And uh, a few of the major ones are um, uh, the Nag Hammadi Library in Egypt, 
which is one most people are aware of. So this uh, happened in uh, the late 1940s, I believe it was, if I got the date right, or early 50s. And it was, uh, according to the story, uh, a great big jar full of 13 codices books. And within those uh, codices were over 50 different texts that some of which had never been seen before, some of which were known in other forms. But uh, um, having these, uh, so the most spectacular ones will be, of course, those that never seen before. But in that group of, te of texts is the, is the Gospel of Thomas, uh, a text called the Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles, um, Gospel of the Egyptians, etc. And they, these are in Coptic because these were found in Egypt. So they're, they're, they are not the original language. The original language would have been likely Greek. So these are translations, but still early translations. And it looks like the material comes from around the fourth century, so quite early. So this was a great big sensational discovery. And it changed the way we kind of mapped early Christianity in various ways. Um, other, other texts when it comes to archaeological excavations or, or find, Nicomedia Library is not an archaeological excavation, but it was found in the ground by someone and then sold to uh, museums. But similar kinds of things happen. Um, there's a collection called the, um, I'm blanking on the name, but but uh, it's just, it's the Dish in the Papers, that's what they're called. And that, that was primarily biblical manuscripts, but there are a few non-canonical texts in there as well. Um, and then we have one or two other finds similarly similar to that. Often we find individual texts, and these can be found often in graves. So a, a text called the Apocalypse of Peter, for example, lost to antiquity um, until we found a copy in the grave of a monk in Egypt. Um, because the monks, uh, some monks anyway, and valued texts, and they may have had that one prized possession, that one book that they owned. And they asked for it to be buried with them. And so we excavate, we find we, we find this the remains of the monk, and we find a book, and lo and behold, it's an old text, and we can publish it. So often it's individual uh, finds, but sometimes, again, we do get these great big ones like uh, the Nicomedia Library. If, if you don't mind me asking, are you, well, I guess I'll, I'll go back even before that what got you interested in this stuff in the first place? Um, and I'm, and I'm curious, having spoken to a few different people from different places about this topic, uh, are you coming from this with any religious background? Does that inform the work that you do? Um, does it inform the scholarship that you do? Um, and if yes or no, I guess, what, what do you think, or what do scholars think from your camp about the other. If you right. aren't coming from a religious view, then you know what do you sort of do with the, the more religiously inclined scholars? What do they do with this information? So I'll leave you with those 30 questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll start with my origin story. Um, I, I come from a Catholic background. But I usually label small C Catholic. You know, <laughs> we didn't we didn't often go to church, but uh, you know, Christmas and Easter. Um, and my my father was interested in religious questions, so he would do he would read um, uh, scholarship and and you know popular mar market books on on early Christianity. Uh, he was not a scholar himself; he was a blue collar worker. Um, but that kind of conversation was around. So uh, more interested to, interesting to me than my brother and sister, but my father and I would talk about this stuff. So I was very interested in um, religious issues, early Christianity issues, and so on. And when I went to university, um, I went in as a, actually I went in as a business major, and then I got a D minus in first year economics and said, this is not for me. And I uh, moved into being an English major, but wanted something else to pad my um, my degree. So I picked up a second major in religious studies. And it wasn't long before I started to slide away from any faith that I had. Um, it just seemed to me that, um, well, as I read more and more uh, scholarship about the Bible and also started to get interested in non-canonical texts, I realized that that, that uh, the church, Christianity does not have any um, um, monopoly on, on truth. 
Uh, no religion is necessarily more accurate than the other. I just see them all as people's attempts to try and understand their place in the world. Um, so I moved away from, from having faith, but it was quite liberating. I was, I was happy with that. Um, but I wasn't... Well, I, I did at first have a little bit of bitterness toward the church, only in the sense that all of this information I was learning from courses uh, wasn't, it, it doesn't generally come from the pulpit, right? Or come from your religion classes in high school. So all these things like the, the four New Testament Gospels were not really written by the people whose names are on them. I'm like, why didn't anyone tell me that? Um, and this is Catholicism, which is somewhat conservative. In, in other denominations like the United Church um, or some others, they're more open to, to um, metaphor, like non-literal readings, and, and it's not as important um, whose name is on the text as the contents and so on. But I, I come from, a, my background was a bit more rigid in that sense. So I, I started with a little bit of um, bitterness, but that, that faded away. And uh, I now just, I just find this, this pursuit really interesting. I, I guess I think of myself as more a historian than a theologian. Um, I'm interested in these people from this particular time and place and, and how they constructed their text and I'm particularly interested in conflicts among groups. So I, when I look, read a, a canonical or non-canonical text, I'm interested in, in what are the battles that are going on in, behind the text. When Paul talks about uh, his opponents in, in various locations in his letters, I'm interested in what those opponents believed versus what Paul believes and those kinds of things. Um, my ma major uh, introduction to Apocrypha it came actually, I think, in a New Testament class um, where we start, where we, our instructor showed us some non-canonical texts, and one of them was the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, the stories of Jesus when he was a child. And I wrote a paper on that for one class, and my instructor said, you know, if you're thinking about graduate work, this would be a really good thing for you to pursue. And, you know, that's the kind of thing you like to hear. Uh, like, you're good enough to, to keep going. And so that's what I did. And um, what was interesting to me about the Gospel of Thomas, in part, was that there, there, there was quite a few manuscripts that had not been published yet. And um, I thought, if I'm going to say anything uh, of substance about this text, I need to know exactly what it was in its original form as close as possible. So I need to get all of these manuscripts together and create my own critical edition. And m many of us in the field have to do that uh, as part of our jobs um, because um, it's not like the New Testament where, you know, yeah, uh, critical editions keep get coming out as we find more old manuscripts, but still it's a fairly established text. And these, all these apocryphal texts are not fa fair firmly established. Some of them have not been published at all, right? Um, so that's what, I, that's what I did. So one of the things I really enjoy about the work I do is this, what we call text critical work, where we assemble manuscripts and, and try to read them and try to figure out what the original readings were. Um, so yeah, one other thing, um, I got interested when I was in university in student journalism. And part of student journalism is of course issues of censorship. Um, which, which everyone gets fired up about, uh, either either just censorship in the wider world, or or if it's just the university administration is trying to get you not to publish certain things about them. So I was interested in Apocrypha as a, an expression of that. Here's the church censoring certain texts. So whenever someone wants to censor something, that's when I think I want to read that. And so so my interest got piqued by by this simply the fact that the church is saying don't read these texts. Um, and uh, I think my st students uh, um, follow me in that regard. They're interested in these texts. They want to know why they're not supposed to read them. And uh, occasionally a student will come up to me uh, and say, I, I can't believe this. I'm so um, disenchanted with the church over this. I can't believe that. And, you know, that's where I was at one point. But I, I tend to try to caution, saying, no, don't, you know, don't throw everything out. Um, it's not all bad. Um, just, you know, integrate this into your knowledge and, and see where you go with it. Long-winded answer so far, but let me just get to your last point uh, about... Um, 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 religious scholars. Religious perspectives, right? So I'm an atheist, so um, I don't have a problem juggling uh, texts that the church doesn't want you to read with, with the texts that, that is okay, are okay to read, though I don't have an axe to grind. 
Um, but generally, um, within my field, certainly the scholars there, they may not be atheists, but they are certainly open to looking at other texts that tell us something about various communi Christian communities over time. So some people can still have a faith commitment and, and, and explore this material fairly easily. Some people have a are much more tied to their religious community and refuse to read this material at all. And so I've done a little bit of work with some um, uh, more conservative writers, the, what we would call theologians, who are writing against Apocrypha and telling people not to read this material. And um, it's interesting to see what the, that other side is saying about the material uh, versus what more liberal, secular kind of scholars like myself are, are trying to do with, the, do with it. Um, and this really was apparent back in, I think, what was it, 2008 or so, when uh, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code book came out and the film adaptation of it. Yeah. Because you got this cottage industry of, of books saying, don't read the stuff. Don't, don't, don't do what Dan Brown is, is doing and, and exploring this material. Um, so that really brought this information out to a public in the way that they that many people weren't aware of the, the, these texts about Jesus. Was he married or not um, as part of Dan Brown's story? And so people really got interested in it. But then people within their own particular communities are saying, don't believe this stuff. Um, so so you get that that range then of, of how scholars approach the material. Uh, did you see an increase? I think was it me? I, you said 2008. I, I seem to be thinking 2006. But whenever that movie came out and i i guess the book would have been a few years before that was there a surge in interest in in a sort of popular interest in apocrypha for sure um suddenly people wanted to talk to us uh <laughs> and, and interview us for newspapers and stuff so it, it was a great validation of, of of what we do even though most of what we were saying is you know dan brown's book is you know a lot of nonsense in certain ways um, but at least it, it becomes a good teaching tool, right? And I still use it in my classes. I'll show a scene from it and talk about the book and say, you know, it's interesting that he's exposing you and the readers and the viewers to these material, but he's wrong on these points. And then you get to unpack it a little bit. So yeah, and when the Gospel of Judas was uh, discovered or published a few years after Brown's book, that was another time where suddenly Apocrypha are in the public consciousness and we get to talk about them again. Hmm. Back to your point about censorship, do you, as a historian, I, I remember speaking with Elaine Peggles, and she had some interesting evolutions of thought on this uh, throughout her career. Are there moments, um, obviously different books are going to be censored for different reasons at different times. Have there ever been moments where you're sort of uncovering the context in which a book was censored that you actually could appreciate more than others? Um, it didn't seem like an authoritative or authoritarian, excuse me, crushing of, of a book as opposed to maybe like preserving a group or, you know, butting up against persecution, having to maybe uh, more rigidly outline your beliefs, uh, if I'm not leading you too much there. Uh, yeah, and I think you're, you're right. Like not every change of a text is necessarily going to be done for a malicious reason or a, a manipulative reason over time views change and so your text reflect those those, those views um i can't think of an, an, anything in particular to give an example but i'll use a one that's that's a bit more in the sense of yeah let me give you an example that that, that i know well of, of how things can change and this comes from uh the infancy gospel of thomas text that i'm most attached to um, it's most well known in this form, which has 19 chapters to it. And, um, as the story goes in the text, Jesus, uh, it does various miracles, uh, both good and bad over his childhood. So, um, in the first story, he's, uh, creating some birds from clay and he animates them and they fly and go away. It sounds like the kind of thing the New Testament Jesus would do. It's a nice miracle. And then some boy comes along and uh, Jesus had some pools of water from which he was grabbing this clay. This boy comes along and disturbs the water and then Jesus curses him uh, and, he, and he falls down dead. <laughs> not, not the type of thing we normally associate with Jesus. 
And then the next story, Jesus is walking along in the marketplace and some boy bumps into him in the shoulder and Jesus strikes him down dead. Um, so we have various stories like that in the text. And there's one particular one too, where uh, a teacher strikes him on the head because he's being insolent to the teacher and he gets struck down dead as well. Um, now, um, over time, the text gets changed in bits and pieces. Um, originally, it wasn't 19 chapters long. It was, uh, uh, I can't remember the number now, so four less. I think it was 15 chapters long, I think, originally. Um, and certain things get changed to it. Um, some of the, the cursings remain, but the one main one I can think of that gets um, changed is that, that story of the teacher who gets struck down dead. In the longer version, which is uh, closer to our time period in creation, he gets restored to life. In the earliest form of this text, uh, that's been part of what I do is trying to reconstruct this, that, that teacher does not get restored back to life. He stays dead. So I think later copyists are uncomfortable with the portrayal of Jesus as cursing people. And so they like to see that Jesus restores them. Um, though they don't get rid of the text entirely. Like, um, and one of the, the things I, I tried to do in my work in this text is to show that our feelings about Jesus today are not the same feelings that people had in antiquity. We don't like to think of Jesus as hurting people. But in antiquity and throughout, you know, medieval times and whatever, the idea of a powerful figure blessing as well as cursing would be fine. The idea, so I think once you get closer to this more original form of the text, it becomes more apparent that the author is not, is, is trying to show you a Jesus who should not be messed with. Uh, and we have lots of stories of people in a, uh, uh, similar figures as Jesus from antiquity who do similar things as well. Sometimes some of them in the, New, in the Hebrew Bible, for example, Old Testament, some not. So this, the, this, the moral of the story of the infancy gospel of Thomas is not that Jesus gets better over time. He stops cursing and he ends up blessing or he restores people back to life that he hurt. It's that you don't mess around with this guy. He's powerful. You don't, uh, don't oppose him. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's quite a, that's, that's a story that ancient people and medieval people would be quite, uh, they would find quite attractive and would fit with their, with their way of looking at, at important figures. Not so much us today. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we tend to see. We see these incremental changes that reflect certain sensitivities over time, um, which are all perfectly valid. We, we change our, our perspectives. Um, but, uh, you know, what's fun to me is to try and reconstruct the text as best as possible in its original form and see what the original writer was trying to achieve. But it's also interesting to see what later writers are trying to do with the text as well. And I wouldn't necessarily attach any uh, um, ill motives to such, such changes. It's just, it's just how people develop over time and, and ideas change and people respond and go back to the text and fix them up to fit the, the new context. Interesting. It's really interesting to think about the, the history of changes of a text almost as being sort of marking psychological changes uh, across time. Are there any other examples of that? Or I, I guess I'm curious, maybe even as a sort of a meta point, is there, are there interesting, <clears throat> As, a, as you're speaking, and even at, way at the beginning, you said something about um, you looking at these stories as, or even religions in general, as people trying to sort of work out their place in the world, or you said something thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in, 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 I guess, like larger psychological takeaways like that, where if you are coming from you know, at this from an atheistic perspective or a secular perspective, um, this then seems like less the business of gods and men and much more the business of men, right? Uh, I, I have to imagine in your coursework, then, then you're just flooded with these psychological insights across time. Uh, and even at the beginning, you mentioned comic books, having a sort of apocryphic I don't know if that's a word, uh, sort of doing the same pattern where you have this foundational story and then people play off of the foundational story, like you said, because it's easier to, you know, if it's coming from Spider-Man, it's a lot different 
that if it's coming from whatever character I make up. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about some of those larger psychological uh, takeaways that you might have or that, that students in your class might have, you know, swimming through this material. Uh, yeah, let me see if I can touch on a few things there. Um, the comic book thing, um, there's a, there are some scholars in the field now who are uh, talking about Apocrypha as something like fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been connected more with Star Wars than comic books necessarily, but it works the same, where yeah. you have a certain canon, so say the first three Star Wars films. Uh, you might want to expand that canon a little bit to include the other George Lucas films. But then we get other people coming along and adding to that canon. So if we think about the New Testament canon as, say, the first six Star Wars films, the George Lucas ones. And then we have these other things like novels that adapt certain things or, or the new films that adapt certain things. And that would be kind of your apocryphal material. Um, uh, you can do something similar, say, with uh, maybe DC Comics. And maybe you want to think about their films as being canon, but the TV shows which are, are quite different uh, in, in, in mostly because they're set in different worlds in a sense, are the non-canonical. Or, you know, you can come up with these different ways of, of using the categories that, 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 uh, that can be used like, as an analogy for what we do. So it's kind of fun to play around with a little bit. Um, one of the things that, that, that um, maybe two things that people are quite interested in in my courses and, and some scholars too, is... Um, trying to move away from institutional types of Christianity, which they, they, they've grown to dislike because of patriarchy or anti-abortion stance or these things. Uh, and uh, anti, uh, uh, I said patriarchy, right? So anti-feminist. All these things that are, be that are becoming in a modern world quite distasteful. And they think they still want to hold on to their Christianity, but maybe they can find some form of Christianity that, that was early that appealed to them. So they find these texts like, say, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of Mary, which seem to hint at, um, or even the, the Acts of Paul was mentioning earlier, hints at there being more expansive roles for women in an, the early period in some forms of Christianity. And that kind of uh, approach they find quite appealing. Uh, a Jesus who's, who's a bit of a feminist is much more appealing than, say, a nasty Paul in the, in the canonical letters of Paul. Uh, well, he's not always nasty to women, but sometimes he is. Um, so that's one thing that people are kind of searching for in looking at this material. And the Gospel of Thomas, too, um, I've talked about it here and there. Most A lot of people are aware of it, but um, this is a text which is just sayings of Jesus. 114 sayings of Jesus, no narrative. And Jesus comes across in this text as a bit of a philosopher of sorts, or a teacher rather than a divine figure who performs miracles. And to a modern to some modern sensibilities that 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 makes more sense that if you say a much more secular atheistic kind of person or agnostic you can um, you can value things that jesus said but do, did jesus really do miracles was he really born of a virgin i don't i can't make that fit with the way i see the world but this text is closer to that and jesus talks in a in the spiritual almost buddhist like uh sayings which are interesting to people who also are interested in Eastern religions and, and their sensibilities and their way of looking at the world. So um, we talked about how apocryphal texts are written by different people over different times in order that fit their particular time and place. But think of also as the transmission or the reading of those texts as also uh, little windows into how the material is received. So the Gospel of Thomas was written probably in the first century. But it's gotten this new life in the 19th and 20th century because it seems to fit people's sensibilities quite well now um, um, in a way that the canonical texts do not. So people are reading the text and appreciating it, um, not necessarily creating a new text to, to, to fit their, their new perspective, but they're latching on to something over time that does fit better than, than the other texts that they're, uh, they're being told they should be reading. Fascinating. You mentioned um, the Gospel of Thomas almost feeling uh, Buddhist or Eastern. Uh, are there, which which I share that sentiment, um, there's a few, I think, that go that route. Um, 
Philip and I think Mary Magdalene also start to feel uh, very Eastern and sort of like have this mystical oneness uh, to them. Is there is there any work that you're aware of that begins to explore how some of these apocryphal texts have been influenced by other religions? Or is that is that purely speculative still? Yes and no. In, in the uh, in the nineteenth century, there was this school of thought called the uh, the history of religion school. It was uh, in Germany, so it had a German name that I, I would butcher if I tried to. But it was interested in these connections with with the East because um, um, scholars were learning much more about Eastern religions at that point, and so they they came up with these uh, romantic kinds of notions about contact, but they weren't wholly romantic. Like we have. Uh, people like Clement of Alexandria in the um, early third century talking about coming into contact with, with Buddhists in uh, Alexandria in Egypt. It was a port city, so things come through those areas all the time. So we can't think of necessarily as, you know, uh, the Mediterranean world where we have, say, um, uh, Turkey and um, Egypt and, and Palestine, Israel, whatever term we want to use for it at the time, as being completely alone in the world. And then, you know, the Eastern um, Asia uh, and China and, and so on uh, being completely separate. They weren't. Like, there were contacts. Contacts. Um, and so it, it's, it doesn't, it, it's not impossible that, that, that uh, ideas from the East could penetrate into the um, Mediterranean world. It's hard to, to prove such a thing, um, but it's not impossible. To some extent, though, I think that some, some ideas will pop up just about anywhere, right? Um, we, don't need to, we don't need to have contact from one person to another, and that's, that's solid to, to have two people come up with similar ideas in two very different places. So that's possible. Um, it's just, so it's, it's hard to make um, 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 definite statements about about whether there is contact between these groups but we can imagine that there would be um it's just not clear that there necessarily were and there are some texts which are definitely from uh, the much more eastern part of the world um texts usually associated with thomas so the the acts of thomas for example in the acts of thomas thomas journeys to india to evangelize and we think it was written close to that area of the world in, in eastern syria so we're getting closer to, to the Indian subcontinent. And so certainly that author knows something about India, uh, where they are living. And we end up also with, with a group of Christians that we refer to now as the Thomas Indian, sorry, the Thomas Christians in India, southern India, that seem to ha have some connection with um, um, this group who value Thomas in eastern Syria that goes back centuries. And we didn't have contact with these Thomas Christians until a few centuries ago. Like, um, as, as you know, explorers move over to various lands and come up to come into contact, suddenly we get these Christians who, who, who value Thomas in subcontinental India. It's like, where do these people come from? And they value the same, these texts about Thomas and they have these ideas. Um, so certainly people moved around and, and uh, these ideas moved with them. And so, uh, so when we see these little tinges of Eastern thought, it is certainly possible that, that they do come from uh, exchange of ideas uh, in in the time period. It's not impossible. Uh, what, what about pagan influence um, more locally? I, you know, you would have had Paul uh, sort of pushing through the Greek part of the world where you have all these different mysteries and different religious cults and practices. Um, do you ever see, obviously, <laughs> quite an influence uh, on them? Do you ever see it the other way around, either in canonical or in uh, apocryphal texts, where you have sort of pagan traces or pagan influence on, you know, Christian thought as it's developing as he moves through that part of the world? Uh, for sure. Often we see it in the recasting of um, Greco-Roman or pagan stories into Christian stories. So we see parallels in. In non-Christian literature, where it seems that someone has just taken that story and, and you know changed the names of people so that they're Christian figures. So, so um, um, I'm trying to think of something that comes to mind right now, but nothing off the top of my head. There's lots. Um, 
And and think about when Christianity becomes the the religion of the empire. It's not like they knock down all the pagan temples. They just put a Christian coat of paint on them. Mm. Uh, created a new story to to talk about how this particular place was created, or this holy site, whether it's a temple or a sacred spring or whatever. So everything gets gets transformed into something Christianized over time. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of a particular tale, but. But even if, uh, when we look at even just the New Testament Gospels, whenever you see stories like exorcism stories or resuscitation stories or uh, stories of virgin, virginal births, we have lots of those stories in, in other cultures. Um, the, Christianity had no monopoly on those types of stories. Um, so when Jesus does an exorcism, it's the same structural structure in the story as exorcisms done in Jewish literature and, and Greco-Roman literature. Uh, we have lots of stories of of philosophers um, and emperors who have uh, miraculous birth stories. So even the canonical stories are taking over or adapting stories that came before them. So when we get to apocryphal texts, they're just doing the same thing as well. It's everybody's doing that kind of thing, borrowing and adapting and so on over time. Hmm. I'm curious about your. I think I saw on your website you had done some work uh, on. Jewish Apocrypha as well? Uh, no. Um, then, then I, I did, I, I've, I've looked at it. I've studied it, okay. um, but I haven't published work on it. Sure. Um, so I have an interest in it, and I do bring it into my, my coursework, but I don't have a, a deep knowledge of, of uh, individual texts, like on the level of someone who was actually in the field. Um, but, you know, you keep aware of it, and you look at it, and you see parallels and so on, um, but nothing that I've, I, that's, I've, I've published on. Okay, but I guess I guess I'm thinking more generally, as we spoke earlier about the distinction being very blurry between canonical and non-canonical. There's there seems to be begging for me this parallel where you know Christianity itself almost seems to be this apocryphal <laughs> Jewish like shoot off. Is that is that too far to suggest? Not really, and uh, um. Or so, Jesus would have been a Jew, you know. I think I asked. I asked a, um, you know, he would call himself an old, a, a Jewish scholar that penned this. I said, you know, do you think Jesus was a good Jew or a bad Jew? Mm -hmm. You know, and he was like, you know, I, he thought he was a really good Jew, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and you know, just believed. He, I think he, he was sort of of the Essene theory, where he he was probably some sort of Essene. Uh, that wandered away <laughs> and became like an itinerant uh, preacher of sorts. Sorry. Mm -hmm. No, I, I, th I think the analogy is an interesting one. Certainly, um, Jews would have seen Christians as apostates, as people who have fallen away from the faith. And um, and that's not a, you know, it's, it's almost like saying, it's like, like Jews is canonical literature, Christians are non-canonical literature in, in an analogy like that. And you, the same can be said of... Um, Muhammad, when Muhammad came along, the Christian writers of the time saw him as a heretic, a Christian heretic, someone who's uh, uh, either fallen away from Christianity or is uh, taking the information and doing something, taking the stories and doing something in a way that they don't approve. So splinter groups are kind of like um, apocryphal texts in a way. Though keep in mind that um, we didn't, it's not like the New Testament was written and then other texts get written after that as the splintering it wasn't until like i said the fourth century when christians said which texts are we going to say are authoritative for everybody so that was a whittling down process of, of four centuries of composition right so it's not i think the tendency within the faith is to say uh, god created the new testament it was all ordained every text in there is meant to be in there because god made it made it so um, but that's not the, 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 the truth of the matter. It took centuries for people to work out these things. Um, so um, that's different from if it was fully formed and then there are splinters away from it because that's not really the way it worked. I imagine that the way the Christianity began is uh, a wild um, growth with people going in various places preaching and as the word further you go out, the more changes get made over time to adapt to the various peoples. And we've talked about the adaptation idea. So 
Christianity in Syria is going to look different from Christianity in Egypt. It's going to look different from in Asia Minor and so on. And then by the time Christianity becomes the religion of the empire, then it becomes a matter of we need to come up with something where everyone can kind of agree, where we all have the same particular perspective. We can't have all this wild and ideas all over the place. So, so it's a process of whittling down. And, um, and so you end up with the New Testament as that expression of um, the, a universal statement of Christianity. And then and we have a next few centuries after that of, of persecuting the other groups that don't agree with that out of existence. Um, Gnostics, Ebionites, and all these other groups that we have names for in antiquity that would not agree with that articulation of Christianity that uh, that became current in the fourth century. Hmm. Uh, I, I guess I'm curious as I start to think about punctuating the, the conversation. Again, this might be pushing it, but I'm, I'm always interested in sort of like the experts. Um, and of course, the experts you know, any discipline want to resist uh, any anything that's like too culturally sweeping or, um, you know, pulling back too far from, from uh, what, what they can prove and that kind of thing, which is obviously important. But given your interest in comic books and uh, I, uh, I, I think recently I was looking at um, sort of like the holy grail stories as having i was sort of struck that that they would have the same sort of religious arc where you have this foundational story or these foundational characters and then every uh iteration seems to be playing off of that in a way that is really complicated but interesting and suggests something about the people who who wrote it and what they valued at that time and the context of like warring ideas um where you know, you have really early Holy Grail stories, and then you have like Parseval, where you know the sort of idiot uh, Klutz becomes the knight, but the whole story becomes about you know like acting out of your own instinct and uh, you know sort of pushing away chivalry. Um, that's like the latest canonical story. So you have this evolution of ideas in there. Do you? I heard recently somebody talk about uh, or sort of like sort of muse about us returning to, you know, modern society returning to a sort sort of like pagan view of having multiple gods where you have these comic books have a religious arc that with that apocrypha idea. Um, I, I'm curious, given your expertise on, on one religion um, and obviously your exposure to many, if you if you have any insights of like our modern sort of religious instincts, uh, because I I my guess is that there are people who, even if they're atheists, um, have applied that religious instinct elsewhere to other stories to fan fiction. Um, I, I'm curious, you know, of of your insights on that, if any. Um. What is the question? <laughs> I I guess my question is, has studying Christian Apocrypha given you any insights into modern religious instincts or religious instincts that have survived time? Whether that's to manipulate a story or that's to use a story to situate ourselves in the world uh okay interesting um i'm in danger of not directly answering your question but I, but i'm just, I just trying to think of something i can say that will connect what i do with what you what you're asking um one of the interests that i have with apocryphal literature is is in modern apocrypha so by what we call modern apocrypha this is stuff that's been created in the last 200 years say and this gets back to our issue of uh, Eastern religions as well. One of the most well-known of these is called The Life of St. Isa. This is a uh, stories by Jesus traveling to India, becoming in, becoming connected with, with Buddhism, and then Ooh. coming back to, um, uh, to life in Palestine. Um, this was created in the 19th century, sorry, 20th century, in the 1800s. No, it's 19th century, um, late 19th century. Um, by a guy who claimed to have, have gotten this information from Buddhist monks, but could not produce the actual text. 
So what he gave us was a translation. Um, so no one believes he actually saw this. He created it, but, but he's doing it because he's reflecting the interests of his time. That history of religion school I was mentioning, where people are interested in these connections between um, East and West. And also we have all these uh, apocryphal texts that are getting found by scholars uh, in archeological sites or libraries and getting um, published. And these are challenging people's faith. Uh, as they get published. Um, so here's the guy who says he's part of his time period. He's part of this time period where people are seeing these new texts. So he has and creates a new text and with these these connections. And he's doing it for what I think are good reasons. Like his Jesus in this text is, is a pretty nice Jesus. He's, so reading this text would, uh, I think in his hope, make one a better person, um, which is nice. We don't want a, a nasty Jesus running around. But these, uh, so we have lots of, uh, well, I don't know, maybe lots is probably a bit too many, maybe a couple of dozen of these modern apocryphal texts. Uh, one casts Jesus as a vegetarian. Um, one has Jesus preach about reincarnation, things like that. But the most, uh, the, the most modern of these modern apocryphal texts is the Gospel of Jesus' Wife, which was, uh, uh, it's uh, been discussed in the past I don't know, six years or so. So here we have this, uh, it's a business card scrap of papyrus in which uh, it's in Coptic where Jesus is talking. It's a bit fragmentary, but he says at one point, my wife. It's been found that this is a modern, uh, it's not ancient. It was, it's, it's, you know, it's made to look ancient. The person who owned it claimed it was ancient, probably wanted to make some money on it. But what's interesting about it is it fits our modern times. Like, this is a, a post-Da Vinci Code uh, interest that Jesus would have been married. And so this writer is capitalizing uh, on that interest in Jesus being married, creates this text, hopes to make some money off it by claiming it's, it's, it's you know, authentic. And uh, um, scholars are interested in it. Some people claim it was, it, it was uh, an Indeed, an ancient scrap of some people, uh, most people saying it's not. And then it was, it was actually proven beyond a doubt that it was. But a lot of scholars would dismiss that saying it's, it's a forgery. It's fake. This guy is terrible for creating this. We shouldn't even be talking about it. But I'm interested in the fact that it does reflect our modern time period. It does reflect this interest in Jesus being married. It does reflect um, uh, some feminist scholarship in the sense that... Um, having Jesus being married changes the dynamic in some ways, though I, I wouldn't say completely feminist in the sense of why do we need, if it's Mary Magdalene in the text, who's the, who's the wife, why do we need her to be Mrs. Jesus for her to be interesting? Um, um, so that's where I kind of think about the connection between Apocrypha and, and modern sensibilities. Um, and again, we have this, the, the fan fiction thing is where other scholars are, are playing with these ideas of, of how, do we, how do we connect this to our experience today? Um, another example where I've had a bit more connection to is, is um, The Passion of the Christ, uh, Mel Gibson's Jesus film. And Gibson was promoting that film saying he's, well, people were criticizing him for it being anti-Semitic and very violent and so on. And his, his response was, it's, this is the Gospels. I'm simply filming the Gospels. So don't blame me. It's in the text is what he's saying. But that's not what he's doing at all. For, for one thing, he's combined them together. So it's a harmony, which is create something new. But he's not taking everything. He's selecting certain things and leaving others aside. And he's also adding in things that are not actually in the Gospels. Um, most of this material comes from a, a German uh, monk, sorry, a German uh, visionary, a, a woman, Catherine Emmerich. I um, can't remember what century she was writing in, but she had these visions and uh, wrote them down. Um, and he incorporated some of those visions. So what we have in The Passion of the Christ is an apocryphal gospel, right? It's adapting material that came prior. It's adding this. It's, it's changing this until you get a new story. And that's what he's done. So I'm interested in that too. Uh, uh, Jesus films, uh, not just The Passion of the Christ, but other ones, essentially apocry apocryphal texts, uh, yeah. adapting, making things... Uh, fit with modern sensibilities. They are the voice of the creator in, in presenting the Jesus that he wants or she wants uh, people to, uh, to, to, to think about. Um, so those are, the, those are where I tap into that, that question you had. Yeah, there's such an interesting through line of like authority of like trying to tap into 
the authority of the character and then like breathe whatever we, we say modern sensibility but then it can't be it can't be um it can't be the unanim like the unanimous sensibility because it's trying to pull people in one direction or another right right it's it's one person's connection with a certain modern sensibility right um certainly most people would not like gibson no i shouldn't say most people um some people would be bothered by by gibson's anti-semit anti-semitism in that film so that's certainly not tapping into that is it so it is tapping into something um that's in our modern time period but not not certainly everyone's interests uh, but enough to um enough to find an audience i guess that's so interesting um, is that the most recent modern apocrypha that you, or did you cite the earlier one? The what's the most recent? The Gospel of Jesus' Wife is the most most recent as a as a modern creation. Yeah. Um, most other ones were around the the turn of the nineteenth and twentieth century. Um, when I was trying to think, oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, another one is a text called the Secret Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's not modern, but some people think it is. So this is a, um, in um, the 40s, I think it was the late 40s, it might have been the 50s, I, I'm not very good with dates. Um, a scholar named Morton Smith went to um, uh, a library in uh, the Saint, the uh, up in a monastery in the Judean desert, and he found in the back of a modern printed book uh, two pages written in, in Greek. So someone's written into the blank pages of the book, a text, uh, it's, uh, on the surface of it, it's a letter from Clement of Alexandria. So early third century talking about a longer version of the gospel of Mark, which he calls secret Mark or mysterious Mark. And he gives two excerpts from it. So two stories that he says was in this longer version of Mark. Um, so scholars are trying to figure out, well, what do we do with this? Is, did, is this legitimately Clement of Alexandria who wrote this? And if so, is this an expanded version of Gospel of Mark? Or is the Mark we have a shortened version of Mark? And he knew the original version. So we have different ways of scholars and talking about it. But um, the majority of scholars believe Morton Smith created it himself. So that would be a modern apocryphon. And the sensibility that they think he's tapping into is... Um, um, uh, gay lifestyles of the 19th of the 20th century because this is in the story jesus raises this boy a young man from death to life so a bit like the lazarus story and then he spends the night with him and so that's a, a euphemism for sex um they think that's a modern euphemism and no ancient person would would would, would use that phrase and so they say ah morton smith he was a, a what we call a lifelong bachelor um he was but that sometimes is a euphemism for someone who's gay. And they think, well, he's trying to promote a gay Jesus. So if it's modern, then yes, it's, it's tapping into a, a modern uh, interest of sorts of, 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 of gay liberation. Um, but people like me and other people who have worked closely with the text say it's, it's not modern. Morton Smith did not create it. We don't know necessarily that it's ancient. Someone could have created it in you know, the 18th century or the 16th century or whatever, or the 8th century, whatever time period. But this phrase, spend the night with, it's actually not a modern phrase. Um, it's not anachronistic. The same phrase actually shows up in the Gospel of Luke. Um, so what I think you have is these scholars who are much more from a conservative background generally, look at this text and say, oh my God, gay Jesus. Um, this cannot be genuine. Morton Smith must have created it. Let's not talk about it anymore. But other scholars like me say, oh, who don't have a, you know, this visceral reaction to, to a gay Jesus, um, whether historical or not, whatever, um, say, well, let this, you know, let's let cool heads prevail here. What does the text actually say? How can we connect it with, with, with the phrases, with language of the time and so on? And what it looks like is this, you know, overnight stay with Jesus is that Jesus, well, actually the text says, it says Jesus instructed him in the kingdom of God, spent the night with him and instructed him in the kingdom of God. If he, 
it's just, if you don't come with come to the text with with a thinking it's a it's a it's a euphemism then it's quite standard they spent the night talking about the kingdom of god what's wrong with that um so it's i think it's in the eye of the beholder um the homoeroticism in the text um so that's a it's a, it's an interesting text it's it's uh it's certainly uh, dividing scholars on its legitimacy or not and it, it ends up uh people it ends up in this kind of a limbo where people don't know exactly what to do with it you don't want to hang your career necessarily on a text that might be a modern fake right um so people tend to just kind of set it aside most of the time but again from my perspective if it was modern that's just as interesting it's it, it talks about uh, it's it, it creates a, a modern apocryphon but i just don't think it is i think it is uh n not modern but i don't know when exactly to date it and and at the very least less scholarship is being done on it because they're afraid that you know or the fear seems to be that you know if you dig into it and it turns out it's a fake then there goes there goes your you know however long you just spent working on that yeah and it could undermine your credibility as a scholar uh which would be unfortunate um but the, the scholarship on the text is is the people who do work closely with it is very good um so i don't, I don't think it's going to ruin anyone's uh careers um Whereas the, the, the criticisms of it, the people who do say it's authentic, it's not authentic, it, their arguments are not good. So if anyone should worry about uh, their, their credibility, it's, it should be those people. Um, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes people are in silos, right? They read the things that, they're, that, they, that will justify their own particular perspectives and just keep repeating what they say rather than the other stuff that goes against their particular perspective. So we often have, we have these kind of two um, streams of scholarship that's authentic or not authentic, and they don't communicate with one another very effectively. Fascinating. I guess as a final question, your faith, um, I don't know if there was a Rubicon moment, but but at some point it had this sort of like uh, influx of, of facts that it could not incorporate <laughs> or, or integrate uh, reasonably. And so you're forced to look at it as really a history and a history about people's ideas and mostly men, um, you know, obviously the further you go back, as opposed to a history of, you know, God's thoughts and his transcriptions through men, et cetera. Do you, do you anticipate um, maybe the field itself or people in general uh, having a similar arc where, okay, you know, we're increasingly convinced that Jesus was just a guy if that's what he was. <laughs> um, and, and do you anticipate a disengagement with Christianity? Um, I guess I'll, I'll question mark there. Um, yeah. I, I understand this is, this puts you to conflict because you're a new Testament scholar, <laughs> but, but do you see people sort of doing what, what your faith did, which is like, um, okay, th this is now just a story as opposed to, you know, uh, this is a faith. Do you right. see it headed more and more in that direction? Yeah. Um, because it still has an authority, right? People are still really interested in the historical Jesus or, you know, even the religious Jesus. Even the historical Jesus seems to have an authority and a pull um, where, you know, I, I don't know if you could speak to this, but, but maybe the more you read, there's less of an authority there. And it's more just like this mystique that loses effect. Yeah, um, interesting questions. Um... Uh, I'm trying to think of which way I want to go with this. Um, I have a, a friend who I uh, went to grad school with and uh, still hang out with occasionally and very much um, connected in, in, with his faith. And he sees religion as keeping people good. And uh, so if you don't have this, this sense of, say, an afterlife or a responsibility, then people won't be good people. Um, Whereas 
I counter with, you know, I don't have a faith, but I'm still a decent person. He doesn't understand how that's possible. So, um, do I think people need religion to be good? Uh, maybe some people do, um, but um, I, I see also examples where you have a form of Christianity in which the divinity of Jesus is not particularly important. So I'm thinking in particular here of the United Church, um, which my, my wife uh, is a part of. So when they get together, they don't really talk necessarily about magic and miracle. And they talk about things Jesus said. Uh, so it's kind of like operating a little bit to say the Gospel of Thomas in a way. And the resurrection and stuff, it's not as important necessarily as the, the kind of a model that Jesus can be. And you don't need necessarily a, a, a supernatural figure to be a model. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr., for example, a uh, great model for, for some people. Not divine, not even perfect in many ways. Um, but he can be a model for people. So you don't, you don't need that. And I think, too, it's not such a bad thing to be able to, to broaden ourselves, to not to ask questions about not just what would Jesus do in such a situation, but what would MLK do, or what would the Buddha do, or what would all these other people do, or what does this text tell us about our situation in life, our existential um, um, situation versus this other one. I think there's there's lots of sources for that kind of uh, knowledge and teaching that, that doesn't shouldn't necessarily be limited to one particular religious faith, which I think would be unfortunate if we just are following just the one uh, of those because there, there's riches everywhere, right? Um, do I see a, a time when people are, will pull away more from it? I, people do so more and more. It's just a shame to, to lose lose the good stuff necessarily, like the community and the charity and the the uh, uh, the way that you can galvanize uh, people in in to do good, which some churches manage to do. And again, I'm thinking about my wife's United Church in that capacity. They they are very interested in um, uh, issues relating to uh, Native Canadians and and, and uh, restoration and of land and uh, reconciliation and so on. Nothing to do with Christianity in a sense, right? The, the Bible says nothing about Native Canadians, but they are very interested in this, and they're not trying to convert. Native Canadians, they have no interest in that. They're just trying to do something good as a community. Um, so I think those kinds of uh, uh, religious communities are really good and they don't necessarily need a supernatural Jesus in order to do those kinds of things. But you, these Christian communities or religious communities are a ready-made community that's already existing. Uh, and that can, again, be focused in, in good ways, sometimes in bad ways, which is unfortunate. Um, so, as I've said with students who suddenly tell me, you know, I've never realized this, I've, I'm losing my faith, this is terrible, the church is awful, and I curse them, well, don't throw everything away. It's, you know, um, try to find some way to reconcile this new knowledge you have with the faith and the community and the background that you have and, and try to, yeah, try to uh, have that stuff work together in a way that, that's, that's, that's useful for you and that will do good in the world. And that's what I would like people to do more than anything is just... Just be good people, <laughs> whether you're whether that's because you read the New Testament, New Testament text, or because you read apocryphal text, or Buddhist text, or Muslim text, or whatever. Um, we just need more. We just need more good people in the world. Well, that seems like a great place to leave it, Professor Burke. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I can't thank you enough for being generous and trying to make sense of my questions. Uh, <laughs> They're good questions. I really appreciate it. Um, it is. On a logistic note, it's a lot easier for me to sort of mix it on my end and then publish it through Spotify. Not too many people will see it before I, don't worry, before I send it to you. Um, so it's easier for me to send through Spotify. I'll send that to you. And then if, if you care to give it, the, give it a listen, uh, great. And then I'll just wait for you okay before I sort of push it out beyond that or maybe, you know, publicize it at all. Um, and of course, if you have any questions or concerns about it or want me to take a bit out or not put any of it on at all, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I guess if I could selfishly ask in the meantime, if you think there's anybody I'd be interested in talking to, I, I, I hope it's obvious, but I enjoy I enjoy this. And, and uh, obviously you're, you're connected with a number of people who I'm sure do really similar, interesting work. So. If anybody's name ever pops up, feel free to send them my information or, or send me theirs. 
Yeah. And this kind of thing is great for people who are coming out with a book. So uh, they, they can get something out of it by promoting their work at the same time as, as, you know, having a nice conversation with you. So I'll certainly make people aware of it. Yeah. Are you, uh, to give you a chance, are, are you publishing anything? Or you sent me uh, one copy of a book um, and I believe two other shorter articles. Uh, I, I, I have to admit, I only read the introduction of the book, but I would be excited to read, read through that. Are you working on anything that's coming out soon? Um, we have the third volume of the more New Testament Apocrypha uh, series. So that's coming out in May. Um, a bit, you know, leaning towards the scholarly side, but again, these are new texts that some never been published before, some of them, and they have their, they're all very interesting. So that's, uh, that's coming soon. So I edit that, but I also contribute some text to it. Uh, and other than that, I'm working on a, a, a very large um, uh, overview of apocryphal text for a series called the Anchor Bible hmm. Reference Series. Um, this is my, uh, the albatross around my neck. It's uh, started pre-COVID, did very little during COVID times because, you know, it's hard to get anything done. And now I'm back at it again, but it'll probably take me a while to, to finish that up. So that's a big uh, piece of work. And then there's, you know, little bits and pieces of other things along the way. But um, that's that's where my um, energies are focused at the moment. And what's the Anchor series, if you don't mind me? Uh, it's called the Anchor Yale Bible Reference Series, I think it is. It's, it's generally... Uh, for scholars more than popular readership um but they do they do like commentaries on texts um or particular focused themes but this one is is intended as an introduction to apocrypha in general and from my perspective again i like to look at not the standard text that we normally see in from the first four centuries i'm i want to do everything which means this thing just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so we'll never get completed probably so it's a, it's a lot of work to be able to juggle that many uh texts that much scholarship and, and try to condense it in a way that's still readable so that's a, it's a real challenge hmm. sounds interesting well thank you again and i'm sorry to take so much of your night oh, it's, uh, it's fun generosity and uh i will be in touch as soon as i uh as soon as i publish that i'll send it to you okay thanks thanks tony have a good night you too see ya